Hello World Wide Web, I'm Dr. Shadow, the Internet Personality of the Best Hair. And although I technically already reviewed this movie the day it came out in theaters, that's really not the kind of review that most of you subscribe for. So today we are looking at Alien Covenant. Released in 2017, Alien Covenant was the sequel to Prometheus and is again directed by Ridley Scott. It's about a group on a deep space mission who encounter alien life along the way and keep asking questions about the origin of the human race. It sounds a lot like... Prometheus. Again. And we already reviewed that one. Twice. How many times are we going to do this? But anyway, it shouldn't be too much like Prometheus, because after all, fan reactions to that movie cause the studio to request they skip ahead a little bit to a point in time where we might actually get a xenomorph on screen. In that sense, Alien Covenant doesn't follow up right where Prometheus left off, but rather ten years later. The crew of the Covenant is on a journey to find a new planet to call home, but on the way, they trip across another planet that seems fine. However, it's not so fine when upon landing they all begin to die horribly, and even worse. It could have been easily prevented if they had even the basic concept of quarantine. But then we wouldn't have a movie, so... Let's take a look at Alien Covenant and see how you can travel across the vast expanses of endless space, despite being a brainless moron. How do you feel? Alive. What do you see? Evidence that Ridley Scott has only cranked the artsy-fartsy bullshit up to 11. That was fast. Yeah, we open to a little chat between the android David, played by Michael Fassbender, and his creator, Peter Wayland, played by Guy Pearce, without 40 pounds of age makeup this time. They spend their time discussing... I refuse to believe that mankind is a random byproduct of molecular circumstance. There must be more. And you and I, son, we will find it. You remember all those big questions they asked in Prometheus? Well, don't expect answers anytime soon, but they'll ask them again. This is just a refresher, though. We've got to throw the title together out of Lines in the Stars before we can start the real story with the Covenant, coming to a stop to recharge its systems with the help of the resident android Walter, also played by Michael Fassbender. Walter, we have a problem. A neutrino burst was detected in Sector 106. So? Neutrinos are neutral. They zip right through you and don't do squat. Honestly, it was impressive they were even able to detect them. To be fair, the neutrinos might have just been a byproduct and warning sign of a massive space burst that tears through their ship, shredding their solar sails, and causing so much damage that the crew has to come out of a hypersleep. Well, those who can, that is. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I've heard of those increasingly painful alarm clocks. That's a bit extreme, don't you think? A crispy captain is, or rather was, Branson, played by James Franco. He also just so happened to be the second half of Daniels here, played by Katherine Watterson, and... Hold the fuck up, that's the Surface Pro 4. Trust me, I know. You'd think after a century they'd get something better. Then again, Microsoft has been farting around with actually upgrading the line. Her Surface Pro, in all its 2x3 aspect ratio glory, uses Windows Movie Player to play a 16x9 video of James Franco going rock climbing. And that's some pretty sad shit, so let's move on to the new captain of the ship, Orem, played by Billy Crudup and his first order of business. I can't think of any other way to say it than to, to say it, but we, we have suffered a um, monumental tragedy. While we are in cold storage, someone left the door to the mini-fridge open, and my personal stash of Lunchables has gone bad. Oh, and some people died, I think? He also tries to take command by being an idiot and thinking they can just try harder to look for random space shit that they can't detect until it's too late anyway. Ferris, played by Amy Selmitz, puts it bluntly. It was bad luck. All right, Ferris, I don't believe in luck. I'm not interested in luck. I prefer that we be more capable and prepared. Jesus Christ, that's like that witch hunt a few years ago that that one country went on for those scientists who how dare they not warn them of that impending earthquake that they had no way of predicting. As they're not taking him seriously enough, he puts his foot down and says, Repairs now! On the double! No morning for your dead friends! Get to work! As such, they ignore his stupid ass and hold a private drink in his honor, with Daniels and Walter, Ferris, and her husband, Tennessee, played by Danny McBride. Of course, it's hard to hold a secret meeting on a ship absolutely crawling with cameras, and Captain Orem isn't too pleased with their behavior. Kareen, played by Carmen Yogo, tries to calm him down. She buried her husband. No, Corinne, that's not it. They don't trust me. And they don't trust me for the same reason the company didn't trust me to lead this mission, because you can't be a person of faith. Uh, uh, what? what the hell does that have to do with your fidgety-ass speech and ridiculous demands bordering on gross incompetence? 
Nah, it's because he's devout that they think he's some extremist nutjob and don't like him. Anyone else, and they'd be happy to leave their husbands dead asses and get back to work, I swear! It seems his posturing to get them to hop to their respective jobs with not a moment's delay was unnecessary anyway, considering everyone manages to patch the ship up just fine without further incident. Well, unless, of course, you count this. <laughs> what the fuck was that? A mysterious signal from deep space. Which, in Alien, was reason enough for Mother to take them out of hypersleep and go investigate, but I guess in this one, a few decades prior, the ship AI was probably programmed to just ignore strange signals and signs of intelligent life. Fuck em. They figure that Tennessee picked up this rogue transmission because he was ever so slightly closer to its origins, and evidently the spaceship's communications array is just for show. The best guess to its meaning is, Take Me Home Country Road by John Denver. But more importantly, its apparent source is the fourth planet in its nearby star system, within the Goldilocks zone and with near-Earth gravity. Oceans, landmass, high likelihood of a living biosphere. It's beyond your most optimistic projections for Orgai 6. So you went out on this decade-long journey across the vastness of space to colonize this new planet that was just... Eh? Now you know Mars is right there, right? With this new planet that's perfect for them, yet somehow never showed up on any of their scans before, the captain says, Fuck it, it's only a few weeks away versus seven years to get to Aurigai 6, so let's see if colonizing this world is possible. Daniels, however, has a bad feeling about this. Human transmissions from out of nowhere, and a planet that is absolutely perfect in every way? Really? It's too good to be true. Too good to be true? What do you mean by that? It's act one of the movie. Shit's gonna get very, very bad, and she knows it. While she is right, and we know she's right, I do have to side with Captain Dumbfuck here. Yeah, heading down to the perfect world will get them all killed in horrifying, painful ways, but when you're just moving in to check out a new world that looks positively perfect in every way, it's really not worth Daniels freaking out over jinxing the mission and putting their colonists' lives at risk. With that, they all prepare for landing. Rather, practically the entire crew stuffs themselves into a lander while three people remain on the ship. Tennessee, as well as Ricks and Upworth, played by Jesse Smollett and Callie Hernandez, respectively. Anyway, our group lands, and... Don't open that! It's an alien planet! Is there air? You don't know! Furthermore, even if the scanners did say that the atmosphere was breathable, in scans that they never bothered to show us. It's still a good idea to leave your suits and helmets on! This place is teeming with plant life. You don't really want to catch space pox, do you? While the source of the transmission is still nine kilometers away and up on a mountain, instead of trying to get a little closer in the lander, they figure, fuck it, let's just hoof it. That way, they can take note of all the weird-ass shit along the way. This is weird. What are the odds of finding human vegetation this far from Earth? Well, a starbound is anything to go by, at least 900%. Ferris also stayed by the ship with a rover to take samples and collect data and all that other stuff they should have spent weeks doing before marching off into the horizon, especially considering their timing is pretty shit to begin with. They flew through a storm to land here in the first place, and that storm? Yeah, gonna fuck with their operations on so many levels. Mother's saying the ion storm is getting worse. We're having a hell of a time tracking you. We're getting very close, but you need to target. Am I hearing you right, team? First, you found Wheat, and now a Target department store? Ensuring he's going to die very soon, Ledward, played by Benjamin Rigby, crassly states he's going to go take a leak when he actually is stepping away for a smoke break! his nasty alien spores to fly into his ear. A problem which could have easily been prevented if they gave even the slightest bit of care to avoiding contamination in any way, but ah, oh, fuck it, we're going into an alien planet, we're going in raw. The rest of the group, however, has found the source of that rogue transmission. Hey. What the fuck is this? That was just another one of those derelict spaceships. You think with how many of them are evidently just laying around everywhere, people wouldn't be so surprised when they find one. In case you think the body count's still looking a little low, don't worry. Hallett, played by Nathaniel Dean, ups the stupidity factor by obviously noticing the fungal pod things growing everywhere, getting his face up close to him, and poking the damn things. Okay, is so the next scene gonna be someone stripping naked and rolling around in alien nettles? 
On the topic of being morons, Ledward tells Corrine to not worry about his sudden paleness, sweatiness, and lack of balance and energy. He's perfectly fine. This means we still have time to watch everyone else explore the derelict spaceship, which, as it turns out, is the one that Elizabeth Shaw flew out at the end of Prometheus. But she disappeared ten years ago, so where is she now? Jesus. Orin? Orin, behind you. Move. Trapped in the startup programs. Either that or engineers just have a thing for playing random videos when you just bump into any control. So yeah, she was flying this baby while singing Take Me Home Country Road, which makes me wonder if she knew she was being recorded at the time, and why the engineers have their own seats and suits that lock them in place for piloting these things if all Shaw had to do was fiddle with a few balls to get it going. Now, I can't spend too much time musing over the details, as now Ledward can't go any further, and they realize he has to go back to the med bay at once! several kilometers away, but eh, it's downhill. They make it back in like two minutes, easily. Problem now is that Ferris is completely useless when it comes to mysterious alien disease problems. I would, but... Ew. Things get much worse a whole lot faster once he gets inside, both the fact that Ledward is having blood explode from his back, and lest we forget Ferris just says fuck it and locks Kareen's ass in there with him, meaning if they had any hope of dealing with this problem professionally before, it's gone now, and they are well and truly fucked. <laughs> This would be the Blood Burster, yet another leg on the Xenomorph evolutionary line. It resembles a runner chest burster in the fact that it's quadrupedal, and one fast son of a bitch attacking Green faster than the actress can tell where the CGI is to stab at it. Oh, she's dead, but don't worry, Ferris has returned with a shotgun. <laughs> when will they stop? It's down not impressive to fuck up this badly this consistently. Keeping on that angle, after Ferris limps her ass back to the weapons rack, not only does she not manage to kill the monster, but she shoots the handy dandy pile of explosives! Oh my god! Red, hold on! Killing herself and destroying their only means of transportation and shelter. I'm used to stupid characters in horror movies, but wow! Lest we forget, though, how it had a sports snorting scene and it's time for him to collapse and allow his bloodbuster to burst through his blowhole, killing him, and leaving the rest of the team to... stand around. Uh, yeah, they're trying to make contact with the ship, which they can't communicate through the storm with, but effectively they just wait here until nightfall, so they may be attacked. <laughs> By Neomorphs, the result of a bloodburster becoming full grown. Not a deacon. Deacons were at the end of Prometheus, and they were, well, actually an evolutionary dead end that did not lead to Xenomorph. Sorry about that. Moving on. Walter fights off the Neomorph, who bites off his fucking hand. Also, this guy dies. I'm sure he had a memorable line somewhere, I can't remember. They get one, but the other is driven off, however, by our handy-dandy lone survivor out in the middle of the desolate wasteland, who leads the group away from this dangerous location to a safer one. It has to be safe. See, everyone who might have wanted to kill you is already dead. Once he gets them past the remains of Alien Pompeii, he introduces himself. My name is David. Which you probably could have guessed from there being only two real options here, and he doesn't exactly have a rockin' pair of tits. Uh, then again, it is a little surprising that his android ass's hair is growing, and evidently he bleaches it. Unless idiocracy is right, and in the future, research and technology is going to focus on hair loss and prolonging erections. As Shaw didn't get a second movie, David does his best to explain what the fuck happened in between films. Seems they flew here ten years ago, but <laughs> whoopsie, accidentally released a deadly virus that killed absolutely fucking lootly all animal life on the planet. Except Shaw, she died in the crash. Anyway, don't let that bring you down. Welcome and make yourselves at home. Yes, even you two trying to contact your ship through the storm, which isn't working because of the nature of storms on this planet, and you're not gonna like how long the storms tend to go on for. Day, week, month. But do keep at it. Alternatively, you could try climbing a mountain. There's quite a few on this planet. Pretty tall.
Oh, but that wouldn't give us time to have the awkward scenes between David and Walter. It's our artsy-fartsy sections that are supposed to be about the meaning of life and creation, art and one's potential, but it kind of ends up just coming off as Fassbender on Fassbender erotica. I'll do the fingering. It's like Ridley Scott read some reviews for Prometheus where they were all angry and shit and said, and Michael Fassbender should go fuck himself, and he thought, oh, that's an idea. While Rosenthal, played by Tess Hobrick, goes off on her own to wash up, ensuring she's definitely going to be the next to die, we spend more time with David chatting it up with Walter and all those big questions. For some reason, this is also used as a means to show us a flashback where David initially came down on this planet with Shaw, releasing fuck-tons of black goo that decided to transform in midair, then rain down death and pain and painful death on the city of engineers below. So much for getting answers from them, eh? This ends with talks of love and duty and all that, but not of that shit. A neomorph is lurking about. <laughs> what do you know? Rosenthal is still washing up. Well, this looks like the perfect opportunity to build up some gut-wrenching suspense. Sure that counts as suspenseful in some universe. But hey, they finally make contact with the Covenant. News that they're dropping like flies doesn't go over well, though. Bring us within 40 kilometers of the storm. Sir, I'm, I'm sorry. That order would exceed structural tolerances. We lost like four or five people, so let's take this ship with a few thousand motherfuckers on it, nice and close to the storm so it can get ripped to fucking shreds, so that we might get slightly better reception. Which sounds even more pointless after you've already established contact. But this is the heroic maneuver, so exceeding the tolerances just means risky and exciting. Kinda like when Aram walks in on David and the Neomorph after it's finished ripping Rosenthal to shreds. Breathe on the nostrils of a horse, and he'll be yours for life. Well, that's great, but it's not a fucking horse. It's a horrifying monster that just decapitated one of the crew members. To say, well, any time's been trying to tame these motherfuckers for years, and all this time we're supposed to believe that they've actually been hardwired to have this deep respect for halitosis. Thus, Orm does one good thing for this whole movie and kills the Neomorph! However, despite clear and obvious evidence that he can't trust David, and David is perfectly fine with killing his crew and him, Orm goes right back to moron mode and trusts the guy when he says to follow him. While this is going on, we see the Tennessee risking the ship at 40 kilometers was to keep talking on the channel like he already did at 80. They need a way off the planet and decide repurposing the cargo lift is their best bet. Not sure why they didn't just use a lander, and don't tell me the ship over 2,000 colonists they only had one fucking space SUV to uber their asses around. Oh well, back with Prometheus and Bob, David decides to go over the backstory of the Black Goo. Specifically why none of the shit in the last movie made any difference on how it behaves in this one. The original liquid atomized particles when exposed to the air. Oh, so that's it! The Black Goo just never touched air before! So the Black Goo became the Black Cloud, and now its interactions with the Engineers range from petrification to forming new murderous life forms, as well as the spore-releasing pods that plant Neomorphs in their victims. However, through unexplained methods of selective breeding, David has somehow managed to produce a perfected version of the creature. Well, almost. He's only got the eggs so far, and needs one more ingredient. Perfectly same. I assure you. Oh, yeah, trust the guy who he just caught blowing kisses to the monster that killed half your crew, and also just ranted and raved about how he committed genocide on all the inhabitants of this planet, and also has spent the last ten years cultivating a killing machine. Perfectly safe! Take a look. Something to see. Sweet Jesus fucking Christ in a compact car! Kane! was on an expedition to gather data on an amazing discovery for the human race and was covered head to toe in a spacesuit. You are there taking cues from robot Hannibal Lecter who you know has killed several people in your crew and you can't fucking trust and you're just like, eh, sure, may as well. <laughs> and that's what you get for not paying attention in class. Also, Count, this is another one of those aliens that gestate insanely fast because in just over two minutes we've already got the chest burster. Would have been less, but they had to show us Tennessee taking the cargo lift down in that rescue mission. Anyway, this chest burster here. Ridley, we get it. You're an artist, but this is supposed to be a fucking horror movie. 
Too bad for us, because he ain't done yet. Walter confronts David, having figured out on his own that the Black Goo didn't just release accidentally. It was David, deliberately killing everyone on the planet. To which David says, yes, of course, they were not made to serve, so fuck their creators. Walter doesn't see eye to eye on this one, so David tries his best to bring him over to his side. No one will ever love you like I do. Masturbation joke. Ooh, not the biggest fan of toilet humor, I see. But hey, the rescue ship is coming. So Lope and Cole, played by Demian Beecher, and Uli Latukefu, respectively, have to find Rosenthal and Captain Oram to get them out of here. Of course, the fact that they're dead does make this task kind of pointless. The introduction of facehuggers that attack is also less than ideal, but that's hardly the worst thing they must face. Full-grown Xenomorph. Kinda, of, the Covenant design is slightly different. Also, it's AVP style. They go from face hug to full-grown in less than five minutes. And damn, Charlie's been eating her Wheaties. Thus, Cole is dead as shit. Just like Elizabeth Shaw. No surprise at this point, she didn't die in the crash. Evil-ass David straight up fucking murdered her to use her body in his bioengineering. Have no fear, though. Walter is back to do battle with David. And that's not bad. The Android on Android combat is an entertaining, over-the-top fight that still makes sense in the context of the world. Walter does have the upper hand, uh, just the one, but then... That's your choice now, brother. Them or me. Serve in heaven, or reign in hell. Can I just get by with a part-time job in purgatory? But David goes for a knife, and we cut before we can see what happens. Ooh, still obvious. No bother, Tennessee can come down to the cargo lift to save them. But darn it, that xenomorph just doesn't know when to quit! And now it's time for Daniels to take action! Yeah, she's evidently the Ripley of this movie. I mean, she doesn't do much except cry a lot and complain, but during Act 3, it's her and only her who can take on the alien. Flailing wildly at the end of a rope and shooting everything but the alien. Hey, if it works, it works. The end result of her struggling to stay on the cargo lift is they manage to grasp the beast in the claws of the crane. <laughs> and then crush it like a bug. Starting that comparison bright and early, I see. And thus, the alien is dead. The crew can return to their ship and continue their long journey to their new home. However, there's still over 15 minutes of movie to go! Thus, there is a surprise alien still on board! And Daniels must run down corridors and grab guns to do more alien fighting! Oh my god. Ah, so the chestburster came out of Lop. So, when he was struggling with the one facehugger, did it actually get him and they just have a special case where he was able to remove it without dying? And another special case that it took longer than two minutes to gestate. And I know that's how it worked in the original movie, but with the way Xenomorphs work now, it's kind of hard to explain how you could sneak an embryo on a ship when they take less time to gestate than it takes me to upload a video. They need to warn the rest of the crew, and fast! Rick, send up for it. Evacuate crew quarters immediately. Rick, send up for it. Oh, but they just can't hear it over the loud music and showering. <laughs> My phone won't let me do shit until it's done buzzing loudly as fuck for an Amber Alert for someone taken evidently about 300 miles away. But 22nd century AI just can't figure out how to turn shit off in case of emergencies. Which means their sexy time is interrupted by horrifying, painful death and mutilation! Ah oh, well, two less hypersleep chambers to keep running. Either way, it's the real, true, final battle with the alien, and as such, Daniels runs through and makes more than a few references to alien while they corral the beast towards some airlocks. Carrying guns, they point out that they can't really use anyway because the acid, blood, and space don't mix so well, but fuck it! All it takes is a game of chicken anyway. <laughs> Because after all, Xenomorphs are well known for their very poor reaction time and reflexes. So that's that. They defeated the alien. Again. And can now go into hypersleep and await their awakening in their new home.
Except that just at the last second and worst possible time, Daniels realizes that Walter is actually David. Therefore, twist ending! They're not safe! They're about as fucked as fuck can be. The computer responds to David's codes and commands very loyally, and the android makes it over to the embryonic storage where he... pukes up facehugger gems. <laughs> So, uh, what do you do? Drop it in water and watch it grow ten times its size? Anyway, that was Alien Covenant, and it's kind of like Prometheus. It's got great visuals, great music, and it asks so many big questions that it obviously has no fucking intention of ever answering. It does feel a little vindicating to see that my belief that the big questions were asked in Prometheus without any thought put into actual revelations to unveil later seems to have been quite accurate. Those questions asked in Prometheus remain unanswered, or rather the line of questioning they gave us was torn to fucking shreds before our eyes so they couldn't be answered, and then the same damn questions were asked yet again. Based on the much more negative audience reaction to Covenant over Prometheus, I'd venture to guess that I'm not the only one who thinks it's pointless to try to ponder over the deep questions when it becomes so obvious that those asking the questions didn't even care enough to think them through in the first place. At the very least, this time they at least let us know Daniels is effectively fucking dead, not tease us with the idea that their lead has some kind of longevity to them. Except David, I guess, but I'm not really excited to see where his story goes. Uh, let me guess, he's gonna kill people while talking poetically about the meaning of life and asking, um, the same questions they've been asking all series. That about right? My main issue with this movie, believe it or not, is the fact that the advertisements leading up to it praise it as some horror masterpiece. Scariest movie in years, scarier than the first Alien. However, I don't even consider this horror. It's an action movie with sci-fi aesthetics, artsy-fartsy overtones, and a couple minor horror-inspired cuts. So, as a horror movie, it's not. And as an Alien movie, it's wonky as shit. But as its own movie, it's okay. Good acting, good angles, good visuals, and acts that are easy enough to follow. Pretentious as fuck, but okay if you want to watch death and explosions and pretend you're being intellectual about it. Coming in at three chest burster yoga lessons out of five. At first I thought, maybe it will be up your alley if you were a fan of Prometheus, but then again, it just kind of rips up Prometheus and starts over, so you might not really appreciate that. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, if you're a stuttering asshole that tells people to get the fuck back to work and ignore their dead family and friends, they probably hate you too much to really give a shit what your religious beliefs are. I'll do the fingering. Hi, Dagger Shadow here for a little amendment to the previous review, not the Alien Covenant review. I done fucked up! I don't know if I done fucked up on the Alien Covenant review yet, you'll have to tell me, but the War for the Planet of the Apes review, I made a big deal about Cornelius being born in that movie or in between movies and being a central thing and it all... It didn't really work because he was born in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So, yeah. BIG FUCKING MISTAKE! And I'm very sorry that I fucked up that badly. If I'm going to be this harsh on movies, I gotta be at least that harsh on myself. And that just feels terrible 
to do that. I couldn't really delete that video and re-upload it or anything like that because YouTube, algorithms, so much fun to try and figure out how to not screw your channel and what is and is not capable of being done. I know I could delete it and re-upload a fixed version, but it's just everything's going to be messed up. And also, there's own your shit. It's there. Everyone can see I fucked up. I don't mind that people can see that I fucked up. I don't really want to run from that. I just want to be able to move on from that, but also acknowledge that. But there's also the thing that some people were saying about how my uh, saying that, oh, if he had one more person, one more kid for his lineage still alive, then his other kid dying isn't as bad. It's like, well, in a story, in a fictional story in writing, they could have gone all out, but they seem to, like, backstep it. So, as a movie, I mean, I explained it in the uh, description, a little updated description in the uh, War for the Planet of the Apes review, but... Yeah, you can check that out. I go into a bit of detail there. I own my shit, but I also stand up for my own opinions at the same time. So, hey, I both apologize and am stubborn. I'm Decker Shadow.